Asian version. Three thousand. One, two, three. Okay, three. All right, it's uh, Saturday the 22nd, technically Sunday the 23rd now. Uh, just wrapped up a pretty long session here at Casino Matrix and was not planning to make a vlog out of this session, but some pretty crazy hands happened. And I'm a little bit tired now, but I'm going to recap the hands in the next day or two. It's hump day, a few days removed from the start of this video and here at a pretty cool location in San Francisco. Uh, primarily today I'm going to be running through a variety of different hands played across multiple sessions since the meetup game. But before we dive into the hands, I just want to share kind of where we are. Uh, this is known as Stagecoach Greens. It's in the Mission Bay District of San Francisco. It's a really awesome uh, mini golf course out here. And I usually come out here, I want to say, once or twice uh, every few months. And it's a fantastic place to uh, have a date night, hang out with your friends, uh, hang out with the family. The mini golf here is really cool because all of the holes are done in a way that represents San Francisco. So in an effort to not spoil that for you, uh, I did catch a little bit of the golf course for you. But I think it's best for you all to come out here to check this place out yourself. So it's roughly 8 o'clock as I'm recording this. And there's actually another really cool spot right across the street. So. I've got about 11 hands to run through and I'm going to start with going through a few of these here and then we'll hop across the street and check that area out as well. Alright, these first two hands take place at Casino Matrix on February 15th. There is a low jack raise to $20, the high jack and cutoff call. I'm on the button with King Queen of Diamonds and the low jack player has been opening fairly wide and with a hand like King Queen suited here, Beauty and the Beast suited, it feels like a pretty premium hand to put in a 3 bet. So I put out $120 and only the low jack makes the call. We go heads up to a flop of 873 with two diamonds. So aside from actually making a pair here, uh, this is as good of a flop as I can ask for. And when he checks it to me, I fire out a bet of $150. He quickly goes all in for $400. I make the snap call and the board runs out a three and a nine with no diamonds. So I completely miss here and I expect to lose. And that is confirmed when he turns his hand over which happens to be 6-10 off suit. So not the hand I expected to see to beat me there, rivering the straight. Some might say that is not the optimal line to take with that hand, an unsuited three gapper, but he takes it down and I gotta give him credit. You know, he definitely demonstrated, uh, what's the best way to say, so, some testicular fortitude there to be getting the money in with that type of courage. So I can't fault the man for trying to make a play and giving some action, which I definitely appreciate. One more hand to run through from this particular session. Cutoff raises to $20. I'm on the button with 910 off suit. I decided to make the call. It's somewhat loose, but Casino Matrix has a pretty unique blind structure. It's a three blind structure with uh, 235, two being on the button. So slightly incentivized to play a few more hands, particularly the marginal ones. And I think this one fits the bill that can flop decently well. So I make the call and the big blind makes the call as well. We go three ways to a flop of a7-6 all spades. And when it checks to me, I think that's a decent spot to start thinking about exploring this hand from an aggressive perspective. Uh, I've got the gut shot here and I do have a spade in my hand. So got some decent equity to make my hand. And because I have no showdown value, I think it's a good spot to, as mentioned, try an aggressive route here. So I fire out a bet of $35 and only the big blind calls. The turn comes a five of hearts and he's got about 300, he's got about $425 left. And when he checks it to me, I want to begin kind of building that story of polarization here. So I fire out a bet of $100. He's in the tank for quite a while. So that's telling me that he's not super strong here, but he does have at least a pair of aces. And after he deliberates for a little while, he makes the call. So with $325 left in his stack, the plan is to go all in on the river and continue representing the flush obviously hoping the board doesn't pair so I can continue to tell my story effectively. And it does come in offsuit three, so that's a good card. And after he deliberates for a little while, 
he decides to put out a bet of $175, about half his stack, and pretty much foiling my plan here. So I just quickly let it go after he does that. He doesn't have enough money left behind for any fold equity to be had. So it would just be suicidal to try to raise after he puts out that bet. And he did ask me kind of what I had. He wasn't sure exactly what to do with his hand. He told me that he had two pair and uh, he was just pretty much confused on what to do. But it would have been interesting if he did check because I was going to empty the clip and put him to the test. But didn't get that opportunity and lose this one as well. So those were the two interesting and fun hands that I can remember from Casino Matrix that evening. I was stuck in the neighborhood of $400 and was able to battle back. I honestly don't remember exactly how I got out of it, but ultimately ended that session plus 350. So nice turnaround after a pretty nasty beat with the 610 offsuit. The next couple hands take place on the following day during a session played at Lucky Chances. We're playing a six way straddle pot. I'm in the strata with three, four of spades. I decided to check my option and we go heavily multi-way to a flop of queen four three rainbow so flop bottom two pair here big line decides to lead for 35 dollars right away and i just make the call i can get behind a raise here because a hand like three four with bottom two pair here is a very vulnerable holding but given that we're heavily multi-way i didn't want to bloat the pot and not get a true sense of what the other players had and so I continue through a call and it gets over to the cutoff and she makes the call as well. The turn comes a seven of spades and he gives me the backdoor flush draw and it completes the main straight draw being five, six. Big blind continues betting $65 this time. I decide to just make the call. And when it gets to the cutoff, she decides to put in a raise to $165, leaving $250 back. Gets back to big blind, he calls and he covers me and I'm playing about $800 total. And I'm presented with a pretty interesting spot here. The most obvious player to hold 5-6 here is going to be the cutoff because she raised. I don't think Big Blind is super strong here. I think he's weighted towards a hand like a pair of queens with a straight draw. And the other player, as mentioned, she should be the one having 5-6, but I don't think she's always gonna have the hand. And I say that because we had a very unique table dynamic. There is a player named Pat Lyons. He's pretty well known in the Bay Area. He's uh, the self-proclaimed best player in the Bay Area. Super nice guy, very confident guy. And when he's at the table, he gives a ton of action and the entire table usually responds and it creates a pretty uh, fun and interesting game atmosphere. And the player in the cutoff was one that definitely got into a lot of high variance situations with Pat. So in factoring that decision in, I decide to take my hand here, which is, as I mentioned, pretty vulnerable. I probably should have considered a raise on the flop, but. My thought was that I don't really have any bluffs in that spot. And I guess you can have some bluffs. You can have some five sixes, some ace deuces, some ace fives. But this is the time I think I'm trying to deny some equity. And in the case that I'm wrong, I do have a flush out to go with it. So after thinking it through for a little bit, I go all in for $800. Gets over to the cutoff player. She looks at her cards for a bit and decides to let it go. So that's a good sign because I was afraid that she could be the one having five six. And when he gets back to Big Blind, he's in the tank for quite a while. And he's a really nice gentleman. He's someone that attended the meetup game. And he's talking to me about it a little bit. Like, what do you have? Will you show? And after he's in the tank for a while, he does show me his hand, which happens to be Queen Three of Clubs. Uh, pretty rough to see that hand, of course. Has me in awful shape. And after thinking it through for a little bit, he decides to let it go. He does politely ask if he see my hand. And given that he did attend the meetup game, I do something that I don't normally do and I decide to show my hand and he was not super pleased but uh, he took it pretty well and we ended up actually rabbit hunting and it came out to be an eight of hearts so really dodged one there and pick up a pretty nice pot here. So looking back on this hand here I definitely made some mistakes and I definitely acknowledge that in particular my targets weren't super clear. Obviously when I'm shoving that amount I'm going to run into five six a good amount of time as well so not a good shove in terms of an overplay. And the second component is misreading the big blind's hand. I thought he was a lot weaker. And if I really think it through clearly, it makes sense that he would have two pair there, despite me blocking uh, some of those combinations. It was a six way straddle pot that was limped. So his range is fairly wide there. So I think looking back, I'm not entirely happy with the play. Obviously I took the only line that garnered me the win and I'm obviously happy about that. But I think it's important to look back at situations like this often players will analyze hands that they lose and figure out if they could have done something differently to either lose less or find a way to win the hand. I think it's equally important to look at hands that you win and try to dissect it and see if you made sound plays. So yeah, fully acknowledging that I made some mistakes here. Granted, they weren't super egregious, but 
I think it's also a part of poker in terms of variance. There's many ways to interpret that term. And I think another way is that sometimes, you know, when we play hands well, you end up losing them. And sometimes when you play hands less optimally, you do find some uh, positive results like this one. One more interesting hand from that session. There's an early position limp. I'm also in early position with queen nine of clubs. I raise it to $25 and I get calls from the small blind and the limper. Three ways to a flop of ace king seven with two diamonds. Not a good flop for my exact hand holding. Don't flop any equity or backdoor equity other than a runner runner straight draw. And when it checks to me, I think you can check sometimes to just give up and you can also bet sometimes I think the bet would primarily be a one and done type situation. And given that it is two high cards that should hit my range, uh, I decide to fire out a bet of $35. When the small blind calls, I'm planning to just check the rest of the way and give up on this hand. But when the turn comes a six of clubs and he fires out a bet of $65, I can't help but think about this spot a little bit more deeply now. I suspect that if he has an ace, he could be leading obviously. But that's about it. And I do have pretty strong range advantage as mentioned. So I don't know how many aces he's gonna have here, but I do think he's gonna be heavily weighted towards hands that contain diamonds for a flush draw. And when the six comes out, he can definitely be in the middling portion of kind of a card distribution here. So he can also pick up a straight draw to go with it. So after factoring all those kind of uh, details there, I decide to make the call thinking that my queen high is good. And so I'm looking for a brick on the river and it comes another ace. So all things considered, that's pretty much a brick. It makes it a lot less likely that he has an ace. And as mentioned, I don't know that he's gonna be leading with second pair there too often. And he's gonna be mostly comprised of draws here. So I'm actually prepared to probably call a bet here, depending on the size. And after he deliberates for a little while, he decides to check it. And I decide to just take my showdown value as planned and I check it back and he's reluctant to show his hand. So I decide to just quickly turn over the queen nine and I take it down. So nice uh, spot here to pick up some money with queen high. So yeah, that session went pretty well. Uh, very lucky as mentioned to dodge the bullet with three, four there. And after that hand, everything went pretty smooth and ultimately booked a win of 1,370 for that session. So nice back to back winning sessions on a Saturday and Sunday. All right, so this area is directly across the street from the mini golf course. It's known as Spark Social. Really nice uh, collection of food trucks in an outdoor environment. And it looks like they're actually doing a, a trivia night tonight. So looks like there's some fun activities uh, as well in that regard, but definitely recommend coming out here. Uh, this isn't a super popular area just yet for San Francisco. It sort of just got developed relatively recently and it's only starting to gain a little bit more mass population in this area, but the Chase Arena or the Chase Center where the Warriors play is also about a couple blocks from here. So this area has really boomed quite a bit uh, in the last couple years. So the video started with me racking up chips. Let's dive into the hands played from that session, the most recent session played at Matrix. First notable hand is a straddle pot. I'm in the small blind with King Jack offsuit. I decide to take the passive route and just limp along. And when it gets to the straddler, he puts in a raise to $45. There are two calls before it gets to me and now getting fairly priced in to, I think, see a flop. So I decided to make the call and big blind calls as well. We go five ways to a flop of Jack eight, three with two diamonds. So pretty good flop for me here. Top pair with the king of diamonds in my hand. Checks over to the button and he puts out a bet of $60. I decide to continue passively again. and I just make the call and another player makes the call as well. We go three ways to a turn of a deuce of spades. So a nice blank card here. When he checks to the button, he bets $150. I'm playing about $500 back and early position has $230 total. So I think the most optimal play here is to shove. The problem is that because I've taken a passive lineup to this point, I have not a good sense of what the other two players have, particularly the button because he's showing so much aggression and I haven't really demonstrated any willingness to fight back through some aggression. I don't know what he has and he can either be bluffing here or he can have some strong value. So. Being that I was somewhat lost, I continued through the passive route and I just make the call. And early position's in the tank for quite a while. And he ultimately makes the call as well. 
We go three ways to a river of a queen of diamonds. Pretty much the worst card. It brings in the front door flush and it completes 910. I check, early position, puts in his remaining $80. Button quickly folds, which is not a good sign either because it lets me know that Button was getting out of line. If he had any uh, sense of a hand, he would have thought about it a little bit more. So a shove on the turn probably was the best play. And obviously being results oriented there, but after early position makes it $80, I just make the call because I want to see his hand for that price. And he indeed turns over 910 off suit for the rivered straight. So taking the passive line here definitely cost me in this hand. The question becomes if uh, early position called 150 on the turn there, is he going to call 230, uh, which is just 80 more and would have been the rest of his stack? That question I'll never know. Given that he tanked for quite a while on wanting to call the 150, I think it would have been a potential fold if I had just jammed. I don't know if he'd call the 230, but you know, it's difficult when you uh, try to look at these things from a results oriented perspective, but I do lose this hand. In this next hand, I'm in under the gun with ace five of diamonds. I raise it to $20. I get three callers and it gets to the big blind who puts in a three bet to $100. He's playing 600 to start the hand, as am I. Pretty strong three bet here, particularly because I'm from under the gun and he's in the big blind. So he had the opportunity to just close out the action by calling, but because he's raising here, he's representing a lot of strength. So I'm already immediately ranging him somewhere between uh, jacks plus at the very least, but I'm in the mood to gamble it up a little bit. And despite fairly shallow stacks. Uh, that's not the most optimal play, but I'm willing to get some money in here. So I make the call and the other three players make the call as well. So we go five ways to a flop, $500 in already, and just looking for a decent flop to continue on. And it comes four, four deuce with two diamonds. So barring actually hitting my hand, this is about as good of a flop that I can ask for. And big blind shoves right away for his $500. I make the quick call and the rest of the players fold. I asked for the guy has kings, he says I have aces, and then I just quickly turn over my hand, which is a hand he didn't expect to see. He's a very good player that, I think it was my first time playing with him, but a very nice guy. And we just table our hands and let the board run out, which ends up coming a seven and a deuce with no diamond. So he scoops this one and takes down a pretty big pot with pocket aces here. Next hand, it's a straddle pot, and I raise it to $35 from early position with three five of clubs. Not the most optimal play from early position here, but as you all know, I like to mix it up a bit and I get four callers. We go heavily multi-way to a flop of king six three with two hearts. It checks over to the player to my direct left and he fires out a bet of $45. And I'm not planning to continue with this hand, but when everybody else folds to me, I make the call. The turn comes another king, so that's a good card because it's gonna be less likely that he has a king and he's gonna be more weighted towards a flush draw type hand. So I decide to check and when he checks back, I'm feeling pretty good about that, feeling that I got the best hand. And the river comes a queen and I decide to check, hoping to go to showdown. And this time he fires a bet of $100. Uh, it definitely feels like he could have hit this queen, maybe some type of queen X of hearts type hand, but I think he can also be bluffing with a flush draw here. So not sure between the two, I decide to make the call and find out. And he tables a hand that I did not expect to see and he shows pocket queens for the river full house. And after dissecting this a little bit more, I did notice that this player was playing pretty snug the whole night. So it makes sense that he was respecting my early position raise to be a strong hand. And that's why he just continued through a call pre-flop rather than a three bet. But uh, he gets tricky with it here and he takes it down with the full house. So following these hands, I was stuck roughly $1,300 and I was in the game for $1,900. Quite a bit of money to be in for a $600 cap game, but I felt still pretty good from a mental perspective. Uh, the game was still playing super fun and action heavy and I wasn't tilted by any means. And in a way I also kind of brace myself for kind of hitting a rough spot given that I have hit a decent upswing as of late. So I was prepared, you know, for some losses and a potential downswing as you should be when you're running well. But yeah, continue to play through it. All right, this next hand, there are two early position limps. I'm in late position with pocket fives. I raise it to $30. I get one caller and the other player puts in a three bet to $120. A little bit of history with this player at this session. I've been holding over him quite a bit in all the hands that we were playing. So I can sort of sense that he was none too pleased about that. And I think he started targeting me uh, for that reason. And so I don't think he's super strong here. And with a hand like pocket fives in position, I'm pretty uh, motivated to try to flop a set here and try to get some money here. So I make the call and the other player folds. We go heads up to a flop of queen five deuce with two hearts. So flop the middle set, feeling great and feeling especially great when he decides to jam me all in right away for $600. I make the snap call, 
the board runs out an ace and a nine. He tables his hand and he shows ace nine off suit. So I take this hand down. He was getting super frisky. When the ace came on the turn, I was obviously slightly afraid that he had a real hand like pocket aces, but clearly uh, this hand sort of demonstrated that uh, he was none too pleased about some of the, the developments thus far in our session and try to, I think, come after me. At least that's what it felt like. And uh, I take this hand down to double up. All right, so literally two or three minutes later, I'm in early position with pocket aces. I raise it to $20. I get a couple callers and it gets to the same aforementioned player in the big blind and he puts in a raise to $220. I started the hand with $1,500 fresh off the double up, and I'm gonna play this one fast. Uh, I raise it to $700, gets back to this player, he decides to make the call. We go heads up to a flop of king eight six with two spades. He jams all in right away, covers me for $800. I make the quick call, and the board runs out low cards. It comes a five and a three. He doesn't wanna show his hand, so I show my hand, and it is good here. And within a minute after this hand concluded, an unfortunate incident happened. This player had some very choice words directed at the dealer and we had to get the floor management involved. The table was in full defense of the dealer and this player ultimately got some assistance to depart the property. And you know, never really good to see something like that. To provide some additional context, as mentioned, the player uh, was kind of ebbing and flowing in terms of his mood, I think, throughout the night. And obviously, I think losing to me wasn't great for him. And I will say that I might have a little bit of responsibility in terms of him acting in the way he did. I'll, I'll accept acknowledgement there. Shortly after the hand had concluded, uh, I have a pretty good rapport with the dealer and I mentioned something to her about the past. Nothing to do with the hand really, but it made her chuckle. And I think when he saw that, uh, his perception was that we were laughing at the situation and that definitely wasn't the case, but I can see how he could perceive it that way. So definitely my apologies to that gentleman for kind of creating that kind of a uh, a situation but I did later learn that he was playing at the nearby casino Bay 101 and he had demonstrated similar behavior and he had been up for over 24 hours playing so I think all those factors considered he kind of lost it a little bit and that unfortunate incident happened and these things are going to happen I think from time to time when you play poker long enough whether you do it professionally semi-professionally recreationally the goal with a game like poker is to have fun uh, at the root of it all but I think everyone should acknowledge that the game is super volatile. You know, at the end of the day, we're all exchanging money and doing some form of wagering. So I think it's important to try to keep a level head to the extent that you can, uh, control your temperament when you can. You know, for me, I too get frustrated. I'm human as you all, I'm sure do as well. But when you take it to the next level and start verbally abusing other people, that's just not something you want to be doing and you want to preserve the uh, you know, the fun part of the game. And so I just kind of want to share that. So after that hand, I experienced run good for the rest of the session. I didn't capture all of the hands. Admittedly, it was a little bit uh, blurry uh, following that incident and those developments. So wasn't able to capture all the hands, but I do have a couple to share. And there is an early position raised to $25. The tightest player at the table, I think. I played with him multiple times and we have developed some dynamics in the sessions that we played. So. When I'm in middle position with pocket jacks, two black jacks, I decide to just call and late position calls. We go three ways to a flop of 973 all heart. So all in all, a decent flop, flopping the over pair here. Early position bets $35. I make the call and the other player folds. Turn comes an offsuit deuce, so a pretty good card, but he continues for $60 and happy to continue again just by calling. Just gonna try to get to showdown here and not do anything super crazy. And the river comes an offsuit king. And he continues again for $85. So now it's a pretty interesting spot because there's not a lot of bluffs in his hand for the sizing that he's been using throughout the hand. So he's either got me super crushed or he's rivered me or he has a hand like ace queen with a naked heart in it. And on occasion, I think he can also have pocket tens for value here that I beat. So all of that considered, I decide to make the call and he indeed turns over ace king off suit with the king of hearts. And it makes sense because he wouldn't have continued all three streets unless he had some type of equity, which he did with a flush draw. So he bets all the way, gets down the river, takes this one down. All right, last interesting hand to note, it's a straddle pot. There's a limper. I'm in middle position with queen 10 of clubs. I raise it to $45 and I get four callers. We go five ways to a flop of a jack eight six with two clubs. Very good flop for my hand here with the gut shot and a flush draw. When it checks to me, I fire out a bet of $140 it gets to a middle position player and he raises it to $280. So min raise, 
leaving around 220 back. And when he gets back to me, just a really easy jam here. So that's what I do. And he doesn't snap call. So that was pretty interesting to see that because he doesn't have much left. And he actually goes into the tank for quite a while. And after he does that, he lets it go. So not exactly sure what he had. Very interesting hand, really demonstrates some of the run good that I experienced, but happy to take this hand down. Last interesting hand of the night with queen high. So those were the notable hands that defined that session. As mentioned, was in the game for $1,900 and I cashed out $3,475. Booked a win of $1,575. And after being down $1,300, uh, that's a pretty nice 3K swing there to come out ahead. So just a few more things to wrap up this video. I know the preference is to have table footage to make these vlogs a little bit more viewer friendly. I haven't been able to make any breakthroughs yet with Casino Matrix. I've spoken with a couple of their management team. They're aware of the YouTube channel, but they haven't embraced allowing me to record at the table, which I can respect because they're trying to maintain the uh, integrity of the game for some of the players that might not be as comfortable, even though I'm not getting anyone's faces. But I continue to try to explore those conversations and see if I can get you all some table footage at some point at Casino Matrix. Another thing is that in Vlog 47, I mentioned that a lot of poker content creators are being hit on YouTube with videos getting removed and getting strikes on their channels. I had two videos removed, uh, Vlogs 43 and 46 respectively. I really enjoy making those, particularly 46 because it was in San Diego. So check that one out if you haven't, but I was able to get it all reinstated with some tremendous help from a man named Jamie Staples, well-known poker content creator. He decided to take it upon himself to essentially represent all of the affected poker content creators and has been working with YouTube and helping all of us out in the community to get everything reinstated. So special thanks to Jamie Staples and happy to hopefully move things in the right direction for poker content creators on YouTube. Two more quick things. I wanna make sure to thank all of the recent subscribers. Saw a little bit of an uptick there. Thank you for all of you that are new to the channel and the content. For those of you that haven't subscribed and are interested, we'd greatly appreciate it if you did. And that's my sales pitch for the evening. And one last thing is that I actually have a Twitter account now. I'm at Andrew Lock It Up. And I honestly, I don't know how much posting I'm gonna be doing through that platform. I made it mainly so that I could uh, communicate with people at YouTube when I had my issues with the strikes and whatnot. But uh, if there's an opportunity to engage with you all a little bit more through that platform, feel free to find me there and I'll tweet at you or whatever the hell people do with that stuff. So anyways, that's going to wrap it up for, for this video. Thanks for watching. And as always, yeah, I'll see you next time.